So obviously the themes you're going to be covering today are very relevant for Safer Bristol. Um, but most of the time I've worked in the council has been in equalities and community cohesion. Um, and Simon Nelson within that team has been instrumental in organising today. In terms of a bit of housekeeping, um, we've obviously got sign language interpreters. So if you can take that into account when you are speaking one at a time. Um, you will find toilets and accessible toilets on this level in the main reception, but if you ask the people on reception at any time, you'll get help there. <coughs> Excuse me. We are going to be taking photographs and filming, so if you don't want to be photographed, please can you indicate to one of your organisers and we'll obviously respect that. Why Holocaust Memorial Day is important to the Council and to all our partners is because of our commitment, obviously, to equality, human rights and community cohesion. Um, and I think you've got a really well-structured day with lots of workshops where you're not just going to be sitting listening to people, you're actually going to be looking at some of the themes and some of the strengths in Bristol, like City of Sanctuary, um, for example, like our commitment to restorative justice and how we can keep those pieces of work alive and make sure that the city is one where people can live safely, can obtain refuge and can live cohesively together. So those, those workshops look really fantastic in terms of the inputs you're going to have and the work that's going to come out of them. And what I would urge you to do is get involved in planning the future events because we don't want Holocaust Memorial Day to be a one-off that happens on January the 27th or thereabouts. We do want programme of events that come under this theme of community cohesion and social justice. And certainly the equalities team on behalf of the City Council will continue And I, and I do want to acknowledge that a lot of schools will be doing their own um, awareness raising and their own projects around Holocaust Memorial Day, but obviously it's difficult for a lot of young people, for example, to be here today. So the Equality team will keep working with our partners. Um, we've got fantastic foundation, such as people from the Multi-Faith Forum, people from City of Sanctuary, people from Gypsy and Traveller communities. Um, and all of those groups working with us. This is not really a council event. This has really been organised by lots of voluntary sector and community groups as well that bring people together. So that's all I'm going to say. I'm going to hand over to your Mayor for the City, George Ferguson. But to officially open this afternoon, I'm going to light a candle and you all will have the opportunity to light a candle later towards the end of the event. So thank you for coming today. And I hope a lot of good issues and a, a new work comes out of it. Thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, welcome. I regard these sort of uh, events as highly important to a city that I hope is going to be noted as being the most caring city in this country and one of the most caring cities in the world. I said I want us to be a welcoming city, and I say that in all sense of the meaning of the word. Um, when people first arrive, and when people are here, for whatever reason they are here, that they must feel part of the city, and must not be left to suffer in any way. That's a, it's a big ask, and it means a big change, and it means us all looking out for each other. And I think 
Holocaust Memorial is a reminder to us how horrendous um, people can get um, in the wrong circumstances and how we must always um, learn from history and if we don't learn from history we will repeat the mistakes that uh, we have seen too often cause so much suffering in the world. But it's not just about the big event. It's all about, it's also about those small events that marginalise people, that make people feel that they're alone, that, that they are somehow separate. And I'm asking all of you, and I preach to the converted, so um, let's, I'm asking all of you to um, get this message out to the whole of Bristol. That Bristol is a city where we are all neighbours, where we all look out for each other. We all learn of each other. We learn of each other's suffering. And um, I thank you so much for what you're going to be doing today. And uh, there's been mention of schools. I regard it as highly important that the children of this city um, learn uh, the the messages, the um, the the messages of, of history that we don't impose on them a fear, um, but that we I think that we inspire them to do good things for each other. And I believe actually the best way to get to a whole population is via its children. The children are so much more receptive um, often than, than the adults. And I think that children badgering their adults, whether parents or grandparents in my case, um, can be a hugely uh, powerful force. Um, I listen to my grandchildren because I know that it's their city that we are all responsible for and I want it to be a great city when their time comes. So thank you very much um, and um, please get messages back to me about the things that we should be doing in this city that helps that big message that I want to get across to people that we are the caring city. Thank you. Thing that I would ask you to go away 
personally to do is to look this chap up because if it wasn't, I'm going to put this down, if it wasn't for Bayard Rustin, it's very likely that the civil rights movement wouldn't be not here. British troops liberated the Bergen Belsen concentration camp in northwestern Germany on the 15th of April 1945, accompanied them, and his reaction on seeing the horror of the camp was recorded for radio. The following is an excerpt from his report. I have just returned from the Belsen concentration camp, and for two hours I drove slowly about the place in a jeep with the chief doctor of Second Army. I had waited a day before going to the camp so that I could be absolutely sure of the facts now available. I find it hard to describe adequately the horrible things that I have seen and heard, but here, unadorned, are the facts. There are 40,000 men, women and children in the camp. German and half a dozen other nationalities, thousands of them Jews. Of this total of 40,000, 4,250 are acutely ill or dying of viral disease. Typhus, typhoid, diphtheria, dysentery, pneumonia, and childbirth fever are rife. 25,600, three quarters of them women, are either ill from lack of food or are actually dying of starvation. In the last few months alone, 30,000 prisoners have been killed off or allowed to die. Those are the simple, horrible facts of Belson. But horrible as they are, they can convey little or nothing to themselves. I wish with all my heart that everyone fighting in this war, and above all those whose duty it is to direct the war from Britain and America, could have come with me through the barbed wire fence that leads to the inner compound of the camp. I have never seen British soldiers so moved to cold fury as the men who opened the Belgian camp this week, and those of the police and the Royal Army Medical Corps who are now on duty there trying to save the prisoners who are not too far gone in starvation. The SS guards, who shot several of the prisoners after we arrived at the camp when they thought no one was looking, are now gathering up all the bodies and cutting them away from burial. German prisoners being sent up for the same sort of work. Kramer, the SS major who was commandant of the camp and who had been second in command of one of the mass bird camps in Poland, lies today in a British prison cage. As we went deeper into the camp and further from the main gate, we saw more and more of the horrors of the place. And I realised that what is so ghastly is not so much the individual acts of barbarism that take place in SS camps, but the gradual breakdown of civilization that happens when human beings are herded like animals behind barbed wire. It will be then able to describe men and the children we saw, the crematorium, and the exchange with the officers who always saw it as well as a graphic depiction of the vast pit of unburied dead bodies. I've chosen to leave these out today. We will be reading from the 2002 book that I should have suspended my child by an for the author. Going back to the rule, will the Jews be able to mark the death? Thank you. 
in Birmingham. Around 20,000 people were held there in family groups in 30 On the night of August 1st, 1944, all of them, men, women, and children, were sent to the gas chambers. What else happened to people if they weren't killed in the gas chambers? I've already told you about the Nazis' first goal concerning the Jews to make them disappear from the Third Reich. In the beginning, that meant to leave. From 1933 to 39, Jews could leave Germany, Austria, or an extra to Latvia by abandoning their property. <coughs> the biggest problem for the Jews who left was finding a country that would take them in. The US had closed its doors after the end of World War I. During the 1930s, Europe was devastated by economic crisis. One after another, every country closed its doors to immigration. By 1939, only one place would accept Jews. Shanghai. After that, the Jews were trapped. After the war, the Germans dreamed of creating a place like an Indian reservation for Jews. The first thought of the island of Madagascar, which was then a French colony. If a peace treaty had been signed with France, the Germans would then have deported around 4 million Jews to Madagascar under SS Guard. But there was no treaty. Poland was invaded in September 1939. They thought about creating a reservation in Lublin, in Nisko, Poland. They began importing Jews there. Conditions were so horrible that people died by the hundreds. But after February 1941, Jews were forbidden to leave the Reich. So they couldn't flee any longer? When the German army invaded Poland, three million Jews fell under their control. Jews made up 10% of the Polish population. But in some cities and towns, they represented nearly half. In places where they were in the majority, they had assimilated like Jews in Germany or France. They were what we call a national minority. That meant that, at least in principle, Jews had certain rights, like the right to teach school in their language, Yiddish. There were lots of political parties representing them on town councils or in the national parliament. Then all of a sudden, the Germans set up ghettos. What's a ghetto? Today, the word is used to identify urban minority neighbors. <coughs> Where living conditions are harsh, like in New York, South Bronx. France has cities with minority neighborhoods too, where poor people live. Polish ghettos look like something out in the Middle Ages. These were areas totally shut off from the rest of the city. The Germans forced the Jews to live there, separated from the rest of the so called Aryan, non Jewish city by barbed wire. The biggest ghetto in Warsaw, Poland, was actually walled off from the rest of the city. The Germans forced people from small towns to move to ghettos in the big cities and cram in there. Then they deported German Jews and gypsies and others and sent them to the ghettos. The Jews had to set up the ghettos as if they were different nations, but they had nothing. I'm going to read a poem by W.H. Auden, which was written in 1959 called Refugee Peace. Say the city has come to the souls. Some are living in mansions, some are living in holes. Yet there's no place for us, my dear, yet there's no place for us. Once we had a country and we thought it fair, look in the atlas and you'll find it there. We cannot go there now, my dear, we cannot go there now. In the village churchyard there grows an old you. Every spring it blossoms anew. Old passports can't do that, my dear, old passports can't do that. The consul banged on the table and said, if you've got no passport, you're officially dead. But we are still alive, my dear. We are still alive. When to a committee, they offered me a chair, asked me politely to return next year. But well, where, but where shall we go today, my dear? But where shall we go today? Came to a public meeting. The speaker got up and said, "If we let them in, they'll steal our daily bread." He was talking of you and me, my dear. He was talking of you and me. Still trying to the thunder, rumbling in the sky. It was Hitler in Europe saying, they must die. Oh, we were in his mind, my dear. Oh, we were in his mind. Saw a poodle in a jacket fastened with a pin. Saw a door opened and a cat let in. But they weren't German Jews, my dear. But they weren't German Jews. Went down to the harbour and stood upon the quay. Saw the fish swimming as if they were free. Only ten feet away, my dear. Only ten feet away. Walked to a wood. Saw the birds in the trees. They had no positions and sang at their ease. They weren't the human race, my dear. They weren't the human race. Dreamed I saw a building with a thousand floors, a thousand windows and a thousand doors. Not one of them was ours, my dear. Not one of them was ours. 
Still in great faith and falling snow, ten thousand soldiers marched to and fro, looking for you and me, my dear, looking for you and me. Thank you all very much indeed. Before you leave the stage, um, in 2000, the Holocaust Task Force was set up. We came up with a commitment, a statement uh, of commitment to addressing the atrocities. And the steering group would like to present you with a laminate of those commitments so as you can take it back to the Cathedral School and please continue to share your thoughts with your colleagues and others. You are the future. Um, as you've already testified, human beings can be bad people. We also in terms to be good. Uh, you are the future, so please continue to spread that word as we try to spread the word here as well. On behalf of the steering group, please do take that and please pass it on to your colleagues at school. Thank you. Thank you. What I'd like to do now, providing that uh, our technology is working, is to show you a very brief video that was compiled, again featuring uh, young people, compiled by the Holocaust Memorial Trust. And um, it'll just show us in about, in about a minute and a half, but I think it captures the essence of today and this afternoon. Um, and hopefully, as you go into your workshop, some of the some of the statements that you're going to hear from the young people will inspire you uh, in terms of what we could be doing as a student in the future. Just bear with me for one second.
supporting community that live and work here in Bristol. So our workshop is going to be very exciting and I hope to see you all there. We are on table number one. I have been told to give you three bits of information about our workshop. Number one, uh, the title is a good start actually, it's called Resistance, the role that we play in preventing genocide. By coming onto our workshop, you will explore how discrimination, if unchallenged, can lead to genocide. Uh, we will understand how all the new people, we, you, uh, can become resistors and what resistance actually means. And we will also use interactive exercises to gain awareness of the impact of discrimination. So it's going to be quite a packed workshop, it's only 20 to 30 minutes long, but hopefully we'll cover quite a few bits. And um, we'll be able to understand how community tensions, uh, if unchallenged, can lead to violence and genocide, what do perpetrators and abusers have? decided to use our workshop for two people. Parts of the world um, to talk about their experience. Because one of the things that happens is that the um, people who people who try to come in for safety are marginalized. We know this so often with minority groups as a marginalized not able to be heard. So here's a real opportunity to hear directly from people who are fleeing persecution and are trying to seek safety here. So we have Hassan from the Middle East and John Patrick from Africa. So please come and listen 
to their experience, ask questions, have an exchange, lose the privilege and the possibility of contact directly with people who are fleeing their own Holocaust.
Good morning, everyone. My name is Valerie Russell Emmett, and I'm going to be um, co-leading a workshop with the slightly intimidating title of Genocide, Holocaust, and Hatred. Why? I think um, I want to just highlight to you all that if you're able to come to a workshop, that's absolutely wonderful. I'll tell you what we're going to be doing. But in addition, there are two other things in this room that uh, I just want to highlight your attention to. One is the book, which you'll see against the side wall there. This is a Holocaust memorial book for um, people who perished in the Holocaust from the Southwest, and it's been produced by the Association of Jewish Refugees. And um, please do have a little peruse, a little look, and there are also some smaller editions that are available for you there. Further along, you also have a table of a selection. I mean, there are many, many books that could have been on that table, but it's a small selection which our colleagues from the Bristol Libraries have put out. Just to reinforce the, 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 the spoken word as a means of getting messages out. Now, coming to our workshop on table number five, uh, together with my colleague Eva Fielding Jackson, who's sitting here in the front row, uh, we're going to be doing some interactive activities because these concepts are so vast. We're going to be starting out with some definitions. You're actually going to be rolling up sleeves and moving bits of paper around the table and looking at how we actually explore something which is called the pyramid of hatred. How does it start? How do we get from lower level banter, stereotyping, grouping of people, name problem, explosions, all the way through to the, the, the ultimate violent steps, not only of genocide, but subsequently denial of that genocide. So please do come along and see us there. Thank you very much. Thanks, Valerie. Um, the time is now just approaching quarter to three. I've got a bow in my hand for a purpose. Trust me. Um, uh, it's to remind you that your workshops are coming to an end. So facilitators, you should be ending your workshops once you hear this bell. Um, it's quarter to three. Refreshments will be served at half past three behind the divide. Um, you're welcome to take those two companies and danger to bring them back to the tables. There are limited spaces around each of the workshops, so please do think before making your choice. We will be repeating exactly the same workshops again after refreshments, and there's no need to come here, go straight to uh, each of the workshops um, straight after refreshments. And just, again, just to reiterate, just to, to reiterate um, what Barry's point is about, the importance of the availability in terms of stores. Um, I'm sure that as we go on throughout the afternoon, other things will, will occur that are on the easement for me, uh, and I will be very disciplined in terms of bringing my bells, bringing all back to start the second set of workshops. So without further ado, um, if you want to make your way to the workshops, and um, please be inspired. The strongest communities are the ones that respect difference. Differences in ethnicity, in gender, in sexuality and in belief. In the way we look and in the way we think. When respect disappears, those differences become targets. And communities change beyond recognition. Remember, the Holocaust and genocides destroy communities and millions of lives. On Holocaust Memorial Day 2013, reach out and make connections with others and help put an end to injustice, hatred and genocide.
invisible people calling out their name. Beautiful people taken from their home. Scattered people nowhere to go.
Ele, Ele, Shalom e Gamele Olam, Ahol e Rayam, Rishrushal Hamayim, Baraka. Shamaim to feel at Adam Ahoyam Rishru Shalhamaim Baraka Shamaim to feel at Adam. O Lord, my God, I pray that these things never end, the sand and the sea, the rush of the water, the crash of the heavens, the prayer of the heart, the sand and the sea, the rush of the water, the crash of the heavens, the prayer of the Your ideas in terms of what this city can be doing to further the cause of discussions that you've been having in your workshops, please do not lose that opportunity. Please feed back to us. Um, we can't take forward things that aren't written down, so please, before you leave today. So, if you can, please now make your way to the front. To the front. <laughs> I'm sure that they, the Lord Mayor doesn't like, so if you do want to sit to the front, please do so. I can only conclude that the fact that everyone is back later than the schedule suggests that there was lots of discussion and debate on your tables and in your workshops. And I very much hope that you've captured your thoughts and opinions to say before you leave today on the various flip charts that are uh, situated around the hall. Thank you very much indeed again for your contribution. As I said earlier, uh, change doesn't come from one person, it comes from lots of people. As we move now to a much more solemn part of uh, this afternoon, um, I'd like to invite on stage someone that I met only last year um, and has been very inspirational to me about my own opinions, attitudes uh, and values and certainly has helped shape my, uh, my, my commitment to the steering group. Without further ado, I'd like to invite on the stage uh, Father Richard McKay, who's on the steering group, to talk through and to set the candlelight of ceremony for us. Thank you. So, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Richard McKay, I'm a Roman Catholic parish priest in the eastern, East Hill St. Paul's area of Bristol, and chair of Bristol City Sanctuary in the Circle of Lost Gate Forum, and that would be quite enough of my labels. Thank you. 
And what we're going to ask to do today, this evening, this afternoon, is just to introduce the lighting of the candles. We have been reflecting upon the darkness that can inhabit the human heart and the global society. We have been touching some of the darkest events of human history. We have also been touching some amazing stories of courage that have brought a light into those dark places. The growth of humanity and compassion and courage that was also a feature of all those crowded into the extermination camps of the Holocaust, of those who were caught up in genocides and ethnic cleansings. The purpose of today is that we will burn with light, that our personal commitment, as well as the commitment of our city, will be to bring light where perhaps there is the darkness in the human heart. There's only one way for a candle to give its light, and that's why I think candles are such a powerful symbol. Because unless the candle burns, unless it consumes the wax, it can give no light at all. There is only one way of being committed. The only one way we can give light to our world, and that is to give some of ourselves at all cost. If we don't want the cost, we will never give the light. As you're invited in stillness, invited in stillness to come and light the candles, let it be a commitment that we are prepared to burn with love, with truth, with justice, with compassion. And we're prepared to give ourselves and let it cost us. But only when we let it cost us do we give light in the dark places. Alphonse who is the founder of the One World Choir and also of Sumat, working with community cohesion through performing arts, he is going to play very gently in the background to this part uh, of our closing ceremony. And uh, he is joined by uh, his drumming group and some of the members of the One World Choir. So I invite right now uh, Lord Mayor and Elias to have with us to, and then the steering group to come forward uh, in, to light the first candles and then everybody is invited to come and light. <coughs> Thank you. 
in our minds. And we will pray. Thank you for being with us. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a bit of I'm, I'm sorry I wasn't able to come to the rest of the session because I think it's such an important issue to discuss and make people aware of. I'll offer you one thought about the Holocaust. And that thought is really that it wasn't the evil people in charge of the state that directed the Holocaust. It was the ordinary people like you and me who stood by while their neighbours and their friends were arrested and taken. And I think that gives us a great responsibility in this day and age, because the Holocaust um, may have happened in the, in the Second World War, but genocide still happens today. It happens in every continent across the world. And that for the same reason, Ordinary people just stand and watch their friends and neighbours being taken away. So I want to leave that thought with you. And I want us also to think about where we're going to go from here. What do we do? Now, uh, my feeling is that we should be going out into the schools and talking to the young people. The people who receive the prejudice prejudices on usually their parents, and um, then we want to make sure that the next generation don't grow up with the hate that some previous generations have. So I'm not really going to say any more, but I hope that one thought that we have responsibility is not somebody else's, it's our responsibility to make sure that it doesn't happen again. Thank you. And now you're going to uh, rouse our spirits as we have uh, uh, listened, taught, and made a commitment. And celebrate our diversity. <laughs>
very much indeed. You've heard my voice all day. Uh, I'm now going to hand over to Valerie Emmett uh, from the steering group to round off today's event. Bye. Thank you very much, Simon. I think uh, it's my duty to um, give us the closing few words. First of all, a very, very big thank you to One World Choir and to our folks for the beautiful music. Thank you so much. Thank you to Father Richard for leading us in the moments of reflection and your beautiful words about the candles and our commitments that we take forward. Lord Mayor, thank you very much for your words. And it's our privilege. How often does this happen to have not only the Lord Mayor, but the Lord Mayor elect in the room at the same time? So thank you all for being here. I want to extend my thank yous as well to our Mayor George Ferguson, who spoke at the very start of our afternoon. The City Council, look at this incredible room that we've had the privilege of using all afternoon. All of the resources that have gone into helping support our very small, very fledgling community group, which is a steering group, which I happen to have the privilege this year of chairing. But to be honest, it's individuals who care about these issues that make a difference. There's no reason if any of you is moved to join us that you might not do it. We have an ambition, we actually want to go beyond once a year in January to actually do some of the educational work that the Lord Mayor and others have spoken about throughout the year, but we can't really do it on our own. We do need support, and we want to do what HMB this year was all about, communities together building bridges, which leads me to thank all of the volunteers who spent time putting together these amazing workshops. And I thank Sari and Mr. Refugee Rights, um, and the City of Sanctuary, the Gypsy and Travelers team, the Bristol Museum Service. All of these people came together to try and impart in a very short amount of time things which I could tell from the fact that the groups were not breaking up and that you hadn't quite had enough, we would have quite happily stayed talking a bit longer. The other thing about City Council is that they've got um, other colleagues whom you maybe haven't seen today in the libraries and the museum service who are supporting this work. Um, I want to actually thank one individual sitting in the front row, Eva Fielding Jackson, who some years ago, she's on our steering group as well, held the candle burning when there was no, there was not going to be a Holocaust Memorial Day commemoration. She said, no, we have to. And within two weeks, she put something together. Eva's been my co-conspirator on the workshop that we led, so thank you very much for all the hard work, Eva. Marie Hackett, thank you very much. Um, and I'm sure I've forgotten someone. I want to apologize to you now. Um, but I think in closing, the two words I want to leave you with is, what now? What bridge do you want to build? What more do you want to learn about, having whetted your appetite this afternoon? Is there something you want to do differently? Because look at how many of us are here. If every one of us has one action coming out of today, or one learning coming out of today, that's very beautiful. And that's something we'd love you if you are moved to write about it, to pop it up on you so we could know what's in your mind. But even if you don't write it down, it's great that you're going to go off and you're going to do those things. Please use the internet. We have had the privilege, and this is another big thank you I want to give to Kyle Hannon and Sam Downey, our team from Ecomedia, for the webcasting. All afternoon. Thank you so much. The content of the speeches that were said today will be viewable later. You can share them with your families and friends by going to a search, which is very easy to remember, Bristol HMD. On any search engine, if you search, you will find out where to get that content. Um, so thank you, Jenny. So I think the only other thing to say is, let's meet again in a year's time, but let's do a lot of good work between now and then. Thank you all.